Hello everyone, thanks so much for having me here. Um, it's been really fantastic to listen to all the extremely intelligent uh, presentations that you guys have delivered. So please bear with me and you know, it's not quite as, um, uh, probably quite as high level. Um, so I'm making excuses now. Um, yeah, I was, I, I was kind of, I'm gonna give you um, sort of like my journey um, through kind of um, my direct experiences with money and the kind of trials and tribulations maybe. Um, so I'm gonna start with roughly of what is uh, critical and speculative design. Um, so what the hell have I been doing for the past 14 years? Um, and then I'll move on to uh, the FOM Awards, which is an attempt to have a positive impact on the payments world. And then redefinition design, trying to create something new um, and then counterfactual design, um, which is when, when I got fed up with money and I need to think about something else for a while. And then counterfactual design, uh, which is the, uh, the project that uh, I presented um, at, the, at the gallery. Um, so yeah, that's, I'm gonna start with, I, I'm guessing, I, I, I don't wanna teach you guys to be sucking eggs because you'll have probably all, already heard of what critical and speculative design is. But I thought I'd give you a quick intro. Um, and it kind of, critical design was coined by Anthony Dunn back in the 90s uh, when he wrote Hertz and Tales. Um, and he says, critical design uses speculative design proposals to challenge narrow assumptions, preconceptions, and givens about the role products play in everyday life. It is more of an attitude than anything, a position rather than a method. But what, the, what is kind of this, what is this speculative aspect? And I suppose, it really critical design was perhaps trying to take back a little bit of the control or agency that designers probably never really had um, anyway uh, when you look at the examples from history of speculations and the kind of success of these uh, so this is oh. sorry that was a highway intersection, highway engineering at its most spectacular. Traffic may move safely and easily without loss of speed. By means of the ramped loops, cars may make right and left turns at rates of speed up to 50 miles per hour. Elevated and depressed are the turning off lanes. There is no interference from the straight ahead traffic in the higher speed lanes. So you guys have probably seen that before. It's uh, from Futurama, the, uh, in, from the World Fair, I think in New York in about like, 1938 or something like that. Um, and, and a couple of years later, um, uh, some of the first highways were built in, um, in California. And um, it was kind of a really, a fantastic example of this a very successful speculative design project uh, and sort of like um, you know the, the the visionary huge kind of scale um, that Adam was talking about with these kind of um, yeah um, uh, ones that don't really uh, uh, work out but then this is an example of one that was um, uh, I suppose completely world defining in terms of the, the paradigm that we operate in today um, so Industry's always been very good at speculation, I think. And um, there's another one that I came across, which wasn't quite as grand as the one we just saw in Futurama. This was by WorldPay um, at a conference I went to, um, probably in like 2013. And um, they presented um, an idea a, uh, that they would combine satellite navigation, uh, GPS, and uh, an eBay-style eBay bidding in the pursuit of uh, the allocation of uh, parking spaces when cars wanted to park in a very heavily dense, overly populated city. So the idea is you go in your, your smart vehicle, which will be connected, that you press a button, you want to find a, a park car, park, car parking space, and then it would, it would then allocate you a space if there was no, no competition. But then if a few people wanted that space, it would automatically go into a bidding war between the cars autonomous systems and obviously the, the pre preset level that you had 
uh, would uh, determine whether you were successful. Uh, so if you could afford it, you know, there was no limit really to what you could pay for a car parking space. Um, what, was, what was fantastic about this, uh, this project, obviously it was like, you're like, what are you, what are you guys talking about? Um, I was standing next to this chap, and I was listening, I was like, yeah, but what about the, I mean, what about the kind of, uh, the companies, they're just going to completely exploit this. And then the other guy, obviously from the difficult, the different political wing than my thinking was, what about the councils? They're going to completely exploit. So it kind of managed to, I think, basically homogenize our thinking from completely two different angles into this is a terrible idea. What are you thinking? Um, so it was a, the Future of Money Awards I, I created as an attempt to have some positive impacts on the payment wo payments world. Um, so it, it, it came about um, at the end of you know, the financial crash back in like 2018. I presented some of my own work at a, a conference, a payments conference. And um, it seemed to work quite well as um, I think at that point um, in the mindset probably of the, the financiers and the, and the payment experts, they were open to new ideas and suggestions in the fact that they'd just seen everything crumble before them. Um, so this is where it was, it was born out of to try, and I tried to basically bring people into these kind of debates which were going on within the trends and the kind of payments agendas that were happening within these, within these um, almost like, yeah, very insular um, um, yeah, uh, environments. So um, the fir one of the first ones that we created was the ease of transactions. And this was a kind of trying to challenge this assumption that um, at that point it was like 2012, 2000. Uh, 13, where NFC was being really heavily pushed, so contactless payment systems, and this was Barclay Cards kind of um, advert where the, the guy would be going through on a roller coaster, you can have such a fun time, and also pay to get around the place um, and just pay for his meals as he goes on this slide through the supermarket. Um, so the, the, this was, uh, I, we challenged this idea and actually can we have more meaningful kind of a relationship with payments. So this was a kind of a pr pr provocative project which was presented there by uh, Jessica where she took um, a line from, I think it was Winston Churchill, that the, the only thing he, I had to give was blood, sweat and tears and used that as a premise of what a payment system would look like just purely on the idea of blood, sweat and tears and, uh, and challenging this kind of uh, yeah, the idea that everything needs to be easier and better and, and simpler. Um, the next one was kind of design a future financial crime. Um, and this was the kind of, we were challenge, I was challenging here, or trying to challenge the idea of um, the, 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 the idea that the, the electronic payment system would completely dissolve and get rid of any uh, issues related to crime by taking out of the, the mechanism of this kind of anonymity aspect. Um, but I think it would just probably facilitate new methods of criminal activity um, and probably much more efficient ones. Um, um, Big Shot was the um, a project which was pre presented by uh, Joe, which um, imagined a kind of, um, I think it was the kind of dark web combined with a, um, a funding platform for uh, illicit activity and along with kind of um, cryptocurrency uh, to have an anonymous payment system to perhaps fund revolutionaries um, within that context. Um, so it, every, every year um, we, we presented a particular challenge, a particular a, a approach within the, um, the payment system and asked artists and designers to kind of respond to that and to hopefully push back and question the, um, the direction of travel. Um, Sunnyside was by a regime and it was kind of almost a precursor to um, Nosedive um, by Black Mirror. And this kind of was looking, challenging this, this idea of um, Money is the new identity, which was the term at the time that was being banded around this kind of cross-section of um, biotechnology uh, and face recognition and, um, yeah, 
payment, online payments and this coming together of, of the people that are as the money. Um, and then in 2017, I thought um, maybe we, we, we put a, a, a project, a, a proposal together, a, a brief uh, called a series uh, of regrettable mon monetary events where we asked for counterfactuals around uh, money. Um, and one of the, 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 the probably my favorite work that was presented within the, the, um, the Future Money Design Awards was this one by Alex uh, Burrett. Um, and he looks at, um, it all went wrong with the decimalization system actually in the UK. And then it got, and then in 2018, the, the Tomorrow's Transaction Forum, which uh, was quite a small uh, um, forum organized by Consult Hyperion. And they got work, they, they, they helped um, with consultancy with like things like the Oyster Card system, but also private kind of investors as well. So they had a nice balance, but, um, they stopped running their, their conference because the big boys were sort of like taking over. So Money 2020, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of Money 2020. So I got invited to take the Future of Money Design Awards to Money 2020. And I wish I hadn't. Um, so I was ready to give up everything after that experience. I'll talk to people about that afterwards. Um, but, uh, and then COVID hit. And um, fortunately, a friend of mine who's at LCC, um, Tobias, decided that he said he'd take on the Future Money Design Awards. So this was run at LCC in 2020. But it's coming back to 2024. Uh, the Design Awards is going to be at Sheffield Hallam University. And um, I'm in talks at the moment with um, a company that works with a lot of building societies. So I'm hoping there's going to be interesting kind of avenues to explore from the, uh, the point of view of the, um, the values associated with building societies rather than la la large kind of um, banks. So uh, this leads me on to the next bit of my journey, which was trying to think of something new. So while this was going on, you kind of, you, money's a really difficult thing to actually, I think, find a new approach or a new way of thinking about it. And um, I think there's quotes, um, well, I can't remember, you, someone probably know here, it's easier to um, imagine the end of, what is it, civilization, the end of capitalism? Something along those lines. Um, that's it, Giannis, thank you. Um, so I, I, I felt like this, this fish in this goldfish bowl. I started a PhD, so I, I really empathize with you guys in the middle of the PhD, um, and then you end up with kind of something like this that you've got to try and communicate. So um, this was my method, it was called redefinition design. And I attempted to try and step beyond like this kind of intuitive notion that we have when we become designers that you kind of can, you, you, you're trained to act almost like it, on intuition and not necessarily critical thinking or re reflection. So um, I created this and the, the, I, 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 I basically tried to create a new um, monetary systems by um, looking at the underlying axioms and assumptions and I used um, and then looking for ways of altering it and I used Lobachevsky's kind of principle here of non Lucidian geometry and then looking at sort of like sympathetic cultural contexts which I used um, social science fiction novels um, and the reason why because like uh, there's often not many kind of social science fiction novels which deal with money and I asked Bruce Sterling this and he says because it's boring and I was like oh yeah that might, might be the reason um, <laughs> and, and then I used this chap um, stuff uh, called David Bidney and he, uh, it, was, it really helped, uh, he created, uh, had this um, abstract, um, abstract um, definition of culture that uh, culture is some total artifacts, socio-facts and mentifacts, overly simplistic but really good to help unpack um, complex kind of uh, structures that then y you can find a way in. And then I went through this generative phase. So the first one, I, uh, I'll, I'll tell you about one project I did with this. So I, I looked at the kind of underlying assumptions of money, which were, I sort of like linked back to this chap, Aristotle, and looking at the, the drachma, and then and the medium of exchange, store of value, unit of account, which obviously aren't necessarily true, but they, they were true at the time, I think, especially in terms of foundational economic texts. Um, I, I, I cross one of those out. Um, so what would money look like as just a medium of exchange and a unit of account? 
And then I sort of tried to find a sympathetic sort of cultural context. And I found uh, B.S. Skinner a creator, wrote a book called uh, Walden II, where he uh, applied his opera conditioning device uh, and methods to people. And imagine he could create a kind of egalitarian society and a planned economy and selfless individuals. Um, and then I designed within this world the, the monetary system, or tried to. Um, so this was a planned economy, so there was a central plan and tell it, uh, suggesting the amount of time a job would take. Um, but equally, the people within this society would, uh, were conditioned at a very young age to place society above their own self-interest. So they were able to have the freedom to mint their own uh, currency. Um, so if the job, drop, the job ran over, they could pay themselves a little bit more. If it was quicker, they wouldn't pay themselves as much as... Uh, and the obligation in this, because there's no store of value, uh, is to destroy uh, the money uh, at the point of transaction um, for the uh, buyer. So the seller helps destroy the money equal to the value of what they're purchasing. And the uh, planners and the, uh, would be able to listen to this cacophony um, of um, economic activity around the, world, uh, the place to, to help plan whether their operant conditioning devices is working well. So I tried to bring this into reality, as you do. Uh, and this is the, the, the working prototype of the, um, of the uh, money incinerating organ. Um, and I will play you a quick snapshot of um, a transaction from this. Okay, uh, and then I did one with we Yevgeny Zamyatin, where I switched off the kind of uh, media of exchange um, function, and then in 1984 with the unit of account, but I haven't got time to go into those. And then um, I've, I've, I became fed up with money for a little while, and I needed to think about something else. Um, but I was quite interested in counterfactuals and uh, looking at and looking at kind of using this kind of idea of this redefinition design or trying to look at the fundamental principles of something and altering them, but applying it to telecommunications. Um, Is it specifically about the internet. I mean, anybody can say anything, uh, yeah. and it all adds up to what? I mean, it seems to me there's no there's nothing cohesive about it in the way that there was something cohesive about the. the youth revolution in music. Oh, but the, absolutely. And because I think that we, uh, at the time, up until at least the mid-70s, really felt that we were still living under the, uh, 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 oh, with, in the guise of a, a single and absolute uh, created society where there were known truths and known lies 
and there was no kind of duplicity or pluralism about the things that we believed in. That started to break down rapidly in the 70s, and the idea of a, a duality in the way that we live. In, in, there are always two, three, four, five sides to every question. The, the singularity disappeared, and uh, that, I believe, has produced such a medium as the internet, which absolutely establishes and shows us that we are living in total fragmentation. So um, for Sarch, uh, uh, back in like, the 1940s, post-Europe, things were different. The institutions of family, church, and governance uh, had greater sway over individual choice. And at the time, Sartre was a message of plurality and was radical. But in the present day, it's perhaps closer to routine. So uh, contemporary life within, I think, Europe, uh, um, broadly speaking, um, and that enables people to de just define their own identity. Um, for uh, instance, social norms like personal gender pronouns exemplify the kind of ubiquity uh, of the subjective personal identities. But um, I think then this is, although kind of um, old Bowie and uh, Sartre are correct in some ways, I don't know, I think it, when it comes to the representation on a network, it's clipped, our identity is clipped and it becomes kind of a caricature of, it, uh, of ourselves. Um, and essentially we are, have this caricature and, and, and it's not the entire picture. So our identity is really complex and, and still struggle to define and characterize it. And I think this kind of um, is, is summed up quite nicely with William James' quote, nothing real is absolutely simple. Each relation is one aspect, character, or function. Way of it's being taken or way of it's taking something else. And uh, the IMSIs exist within the SIM uh, to connect to the network. And I think uh, the SIM is the unique identifier um, that we use within these devices. Um, so I was looking at this as the kind of fundamental, kind of a, uh, a bit like the kind of fundamental around money. In, uh, this is, I think, the fundamental within the system uh, of our telecommunications. Um, but the thing is, we're not, just, we're not just a number. We're not just one. We, we, it's not like kind of just an only, we're not only just an ego um, um, within represented by a number, uh, because I think uh, our title can uh, identify uh, gender, his, her, they, marriage status, uh, miss, miss, missus, age, m master, um, professor, um, or kind of reverend in religion. So we all have a host of kind of personal identifiers, uh, but they do not only tell us about the individual, but how that individual links to the wider world. Thus, um, social identifiers can connect individuals alongside a method to differentiate between them. Um, so I, I kind of tried to uh, look at the kind of international mobile, mobile describer identity that bodies the notion that our identity is solely found within an individual. However, to identify uh, solely a given person in isolation is an assumption that overlooks the connectedness of our being within society. And could identifiers be redefined within telecoms to uh, resonate with our common notions of identity? And I think there are, there are examples of challenging like monopolies in the past. So this is um, Thomas Carter's 1950s uh, Carter phone, and it was a device that turned the regular AT&T line into a mobile two-way radio. And this device was in violation of the AT&T lines because they were obviously owned at that point. Uh, Carter took AT&T to court, and in 1968, the Federal Communication Commission granted the right for the third-party devices to use AT&T lines. And he continued, he continued with this um, to contest the status quo of big business during the development of these mobile phones in the 1970s. Uh, in 1973, uh, the social identifier phone was developed at Carter Phone, um, and it essentially enabled the user to be identified as a group so the sims were stackable on the base of the unit, and each one would represent a group that you belong to, family, work, or a community. And when the family number was rung, all the phones within that sim uh, would that was installed would ring at the same time. And the calls would be managed socially between the group. Um, another one uh, that was um, produced later on in 1975 the place identity phone uh, was developed by Carter Phone, and the idea was to um, reconnect identity to place by allowing the user to connect to a specific location, like work or home, via a dedicated uh, antenna, an area code, and this brought the 
control back uh, to the user in relation to a work-life balance. And finally, before, he sadly, sadly, the business went under. Uh, but in 1979, prior to the Carter phone going into administration, uh, the changing identifying fire phone was developed. And this took uh, its inspiration from bundle theory, that people's identity changed as they went through life. And to reflect that, the phone number would count. And this meant that phone numbers couldn't be remembered or used without a device counting with, in a cellular network. Uh, and this effect would essentially mean identity, identities would naturally be forgotten without concerted effort. Uh, unfortunately, yeah, so Carter phone, although um, Thomas Carter later creations were financially unsuccessful, they serve as a reminder for us to move away from the deterministic view of development and that technology's ubiquity should be uh, not assumed to be technological correctness. All right, so I'm, I'm rushing through, sorry guys. Um, and then finally, I'm at the counterfactual design. And this was, so this is um, work in progress because um, I, I saw um, the call and I thought I'll, I'll come back to the money projects. Um, and I, but I used the counterfactual approach again. So, um, and I thought from this point, um, if I can't beat them, maybe I should join them. And I, and I thought about that from the perspective of this book. Um, so the term of credit card was first coined by Edward Bellew back in 1988. But this was uh, a device used by all citizens to spend their state dividend. So regardless of this initial motivation, in this case, uh, a socialist utopia, uh, capitalism is very good at selecting these kind of bits and, uh, and exploiting these. And I thought maybe um, I should have a go at doing the same. So I, this morning, uh, I was listening to one of, uh, I'm sure you guys listen to her every morning as well, Margaret Thatcher. I believe you won't keep political freedom unless you also have economic freedom, which means that you must have a large part of free enterprise in your whole economy. Now, you make the point about minimum income. I think in societies where there are enormous differences between very great wealth and very great poverty, I would recoil from that. You recoil from what? From enormous differences between very great wealth in the presence of very great poverty. That, that no, has no, 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 no. Yes, but it has. One moment. What? You wait. I'm coming to okay. that. So there is therefore something to be said for a certain amount of redistribution there from by taxation, and you've done it as well as we have. This is what taxation is about. So you do do a certain amount of redistribution from those, I, yes, I know you're getting very irritated, but just wait one moment, uh, from those uh, to, to try to help people who are poverty stricken to get up off the floor and raise their standard. And we would call but that, that not a minimum wage, yeah. we would call that a basic safety net. And we would accept a moral commitment in a kind of society like yours or ours that jointly we do try to guarantee some basic standard of life, and indeed um, uh, rather more than a basic standard of life. But there are certain um, benefits you can get from social security. So, I believe um, based on, and also Hayek, uh, uh, Margaret was obviously known for this, the love of this chap. Um, he, he wrote, um, in the um, Constitution of Liberty, we shall not consider separately uh, the problem which arises from the fact that through progressive taxation, although progressive taxation today, the chief instrument uh, of income redistribution, it is not the only method by which the latter can be achieved. It is clearly uh, possible to bring about considerable redistribution under a system of pro uh, proportional uh, tax uh, taxation. All that is necessary is to use a subst um, substantial part of the revenue to provide services which benefit mainly a particular class or to uh, subsidize them directly. So I've, I, I've actually come across another uh, particular device which wasn't necessarily um, particularly well known about at the time, but there was a, a prominent um, researcher within Whitehall who created a prototype uh, trickle-down device exploiting the, the IBM's uh, magnetic strip cards that were invented in the 1969. Um, and it would, the idea was that it, it put trickle-down into a function of money. 
Um, so at the top there will be the total um, account um, <coughs> amount. Uh, the card slot would be uh, the activation and the kind of key to facilitate the, the device. Um, and then there'll be a socio-economic uh, selector for the trickle-down. So you could have some choice in where which particular uh, bracket um, the, the trickle-down would go to uh, on the socio-economic scale. Uh, and then the trickle offset. Uh, so um, providing that you're spending the money in the, uh, um, in the vicinity or in the, the, in the society, um, there was a buffer. Um, which would, the trickle down would initially come out of, but if you stop spending, it would come out directly onto the account and go down to another um, an, another device. Um, but also uh, to, because because choice is the main um, the main thing that we're interested in, um, the trickle rate could increase as well. So there is an option that. Uh, the owner of this device could increase the amount of uh, trickle that they enable through their, their, their device. But it would get rid of completely the uh, income tax um, and it would be a direct um, distribution of wealth. Um, this would be the basic uh, safety net device, which um, the, um, Mr. Thatcher was uh, talking about, where it would be a public, um, in the public sphere, where you could come along and put your card into the device and it would enable the, the residual trickle down from the top. Another device which was um, recently found from the archives but unfortunately again not used. It's the, it's the mission of this government to ensure that insofar as COVID has entrenched problems and deepened inequalities, we need now to work double hard to overturn those inequalities. And so that as far as possible, everyone everywhere feels the benefits of that recovery and that we build back better across the whole of the UK. And we need to say from the beginning that before the pandemic began, the UK had and still has a more unbalanced economy than almost all our immediate biggest competitors in, in Europe and more unbalanced than pretty much every major developed economy. And when I say unbalanced, I mean that for too many people, geography turns out to be destiny. Take life expectancy, even before COVID hit. It's a, an outrage that a man in Glasgow or Blackpool has an average of 10 years less on this planet than someone growing up in Hart in Hampshire or in Rutland. And I don't know what people do in Rutland to live to prodigious ages. Uh, who knows? Uh, but they do. And uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a glaring imbalance. And it's the mission of this government to unite and level up across the whole UK, not just because that is morally right, but because if we fail, then we are simply squandering vast reserves of human capital. And we're failing to allow people to fulfill their potential, and we are holding our country back. So fortunately, Boris recognised that the, the, to put these aims into practice, some aspects of the system needs to be changed. Um, so the real economic incentives were, were critical in order to bring about investment in the uh, economically deprived areas. Hence, he created the levelling up device, uh, and this was launched alongside a new CBDC, so central bank digital currency um, in the pound, um, to provide a variable VAT rate that can be adjusted between um, counties uh, and even areas within a given city. Um, so uh, the, the VAT rate can be adjusted with the huge, the large knob at the top, uh, and the select, uh, select, selects the area, and then obviously Richie Sunak and Boris Johnson can activate that uh, after a budget and after the, the relevant uh, legislation has been put through. Um, and he also wanted to communicate the progress of this initi initiative and, all, and its impact. Hence, uh, upon every new budget, a new 3D wealth disparity map would be printed and placed on the wall at number 10 uh, as a direct feedback on the success of the current VAT rates that have been chosen. Um, I'll stop, stop there. Thanks very much, everyone.